As we acknowledge the land this morning, let's slow down a moment and just ground ourselves right where we are. I invite you to pause, maybe take a breath, and feel how your body is anchored here, held by the force of gravity. And now we can notice the land itself and feel how it supports us. We recognize that indigenous peoples have served as stewards of this land for thousands of years, long before European settlers came with the intent to colonize. Indigenous peoples continue to care for this land, and we have much to be grateful for and much to learn. We're hosted on the lands of the Mississaugas of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Wendat. We also recognize the enduring presence of all First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples. We honor the light of creation alive in their hearts. And in the face of systemic racism here in Canada and the many ways we perpetuate it, we are called to listen and learn, to challenge and change the status quo, and to allow space for others to walk their paths. The light of Christ calls us to this work. We make the road by walking one step at a time, following faithfully in the way of Jesus, the peacemaker. And we're glad that you're here because we are a community here at Islington United of people who don't think the same or vote the same or love the same, but we're making our way as followers of Christ. It's my privilege to join you in worship whatever time of day you're finding us. May your heart and your mind and your body be open to what God will speak into this time and space. It's a gift to have a special guest. Faith Amor is with us for the next two Sundays, and I pray that her special gift of music will touch hearts and move us deeper into the themes we'll explore in these next two weeks together. Come, let us worship a God who created this world and calls us to live in it and seek aliveness. of worship, when we gather as a community, we turn towards our communion table and light our memorial lights. On this day, you're probably remembering someone who you've loved who's not with you in person but in spirit, and so we honor those who have gone before part of the cloud of witnesses. 
And especially today, we honor those who taught you about loving your neighbor, making a difference in your community, and being the God image that you reflect into the world. Let's hold that light as we remember we're walking the path of peace. The living God is with us and with all creation. A passage from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 31 to 40. Through these words, may we see God more clearly, love God more dearly, and follow God more dearly, day by day. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, You that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me some clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and clothed you? And when was it that we saw you sick, or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly, I tell you, just as you did it for the least of these who are my members of my family, you did it for me. Herein lies good news. Thanks be to God.
from the message, Genesis chapter 32, verse 22, to chapter 33, verse 11. May we be equipped by these words to walk in love for God, ourselves, our neighbors, all people, and all God's creation. But during the night, he got up and took his two wives, his two maidservants, and his eleven children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He got them safely across the brook, along with all his possessions. But Jacob stayed behind by himself, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he couldn't get the best of Jacob as they wrestled, he deliberately threw Jacob's hip out of joint. The man said, let me go, it's daybreak. Jacob said, I'm not letting you go until you bless me. The man said, what is your name? He answered, Jacob. The man said, but no longer, your name is no longer Jacob, for now on it's Israel, God's wrestler, for you've wrestled with God and you've come through. And Jacob asked, what's your name? And the man said, why do you want to know my name? And then right then and there, he blessed him. Jacob called this place Peniel, God's face, because he said, I saw God face to face and lived to tell the story. The sun came up as he left Peniel, limping because of the hip. And this is why Israelites to this day don't eat the hip muscle because Jacob's hip was thrown out of joint. Jacob looked up and saw Esau coming with his 400 men. 
he divided his children between Leah and Rachel and the two maidservants. He put the maidservants out in front, Leah and her children next, and Rachel and Joseph last. He led the way, and as he approached his brother, bowed seven times, honoring his brother. But Esau ran up and embraced him, held him tight and kissed him, and they both wept. Then Esau looked around and saw the women and children, and who are these with you? Jacob said, the children that God saw fit to bless me with. And then the maidservants came up with their children and bowed, then Leah and her children also bowing, and finally Joseph and Rachel came up and bowed to Esau. Esau then asked, and what was the meaning of all those herds that I met? I was hoping that they would pave the way for my master to welcome me. Esau said, O oh brother, I have plenty of everything. Keep what is yours for yourself. And Jacob answered, Please, if you can find it in your heart to welcome me, accept these gifts. When I saw your face, it was as the face of God smiling on me. Accept the gifts I have brought for you. God has been good to me, and I have more than enough. Jacob urged the gifts on him, and Esau accepted. Herein lies wisdom. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy One, open our eyes our ears, our minds, our hearts, to meet you in this story today. We bring our own stories as we engage these ancient ones. We offer prayers for our own families as we get a glimpse into the families in the book of Genesis. May we listen for your wisdom and goodness between the words that are said and the words that are heard. May your word be known. Amen. It's hard to imagine that a year ago we were filled to overflowing, celebrating 40 years of refugee support here at Islington United. Strollers moved from different parts of the building and families gathering who hadn't seen each other for years. The steward stall was packed to share a meal at round tables and hear about families who had relocated to Canada and been in relationship with families from Islington for almost two generations in some of the lives of their families. And so we miss being together. We miss our church family. We miss sitting and hearing each other's news and offering hugs and moments of connection across the pews. When we're at home lately, I've been turning to the families of sitcoms to bring some comfort, to remind us of other moments in time. I wonder what TV families are becoming like your own lately. Is it the Pritchetts and the Dumphys of modern family? Could you have gone farther back and been paying attention to the Bundys from Married with Children or the Bravermans in Parenthood? How about the Bunkers from All in the Family, the Cunninghams from Happy Days, the Banks family from Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, the Brady Bunch, the Winslow family from Family Matters, who invited Urkel into their full family, the Waltons, the Ingalls, the Crawleys on Downton Abbey, and lately in our house it's been the McKellens from Family Reunion and two generations of the Tanners from Full House and Fuller House. I want you to picture two little girls who've lost their mom, whose uncles have moved in to be with them. In the first episode of Full House, Stephanie and DJ have to share a room, and it only takes about four minutes into the show before DJ has drawn a line of duct tape straight across the room, marking which side is the older sisters and which side is the younger's. Of course, she tells her younger sister she can't cross the line and DJ has the door on her side of the room, so she has to get creative and crawl across the curtain or get a piggyback to get out. 
But I want you to picture those moments of how we reflect on our family by looking into the stories and lives of other families. It's amazing to me to think that the stories we're reading right now in Genesis are the sitcoms of Jesus' time. Perhaps the epic movies or the soap operas, but these stories would have been told to him over and over. And as we move through these stories in Genesis, we're given glimpses into the homes of a few families, aware of the rivalry and relationships of these siblings, Cain and Abel, Ishmael and Isaac, Jacob and Esau, Leah and Rachel, Joseph and his 11 brothers, and one sister, Dinah. I wonder how you read these stories, whose sibling you gravitate towards, who you relate to, who reminds you of someone in your own family or a family you know closely. It can be easy for us to look at these relationships and sort them into good and bad, faithful and wanderer, to look at the stereotypes of favored or the eldest. We can be tempted into a duality instead of looking at the complicatedness of sibling relationships. And if you don't have a sibling, perhaps as in many of our stories, you have a rival or a competitor or even an enemy. In order to explore this particular part of Jacob and Esau's story, we must remember that at different parts in the stories, these twins had a different relationship. They were all of these things, close brothers born on the same day. They were also competitors, rivals for parental love, even enemies after Jacob tricked Esau out of his birthright and his blessing from his father, and then he ran away in the night. Jacob and Esau draw a line in the sand and are apart for many years. There's a boundary there between rivalry and reconciliation. It's a space between, a desert between. It's not a safe space, and it's filled with all the backstory of being siblings. The hurt, the unfairness, the loss, the taking of sides both thinking they are right. It's more of a no man's land of relationships, that space between. And I wonder if you've ever found yourself on one side of this kind of divide, either stuck in the script that keeps playing over and over around your part being right or theirs being wrong, or wishing that the sitcom music would play, the laugh track would come up, and the script writers would tie everything up in 22 to 23 minutes, commercial-free, including that moment of reconciliation. Reconciliation, which in the dictionary is defined as the restoration of friendly relations. Friendly relations. It sounds so easy, doesn't it? I was reminded this week of a story from Canada's process of truth and reconciliation. Murray Sinclair, senator and indigenous elder, he greeted um, at the Halifax gathering for the stories of residential school survivors to be heard. He said out loud to the community gathered there, if you are here to hold on to anger, you are here for the truth part, not here for the reconciliation part. For something about the space between, the no man's land of relationships, calls us to leave some things behind in order to leave that place. And before we get to the reconciliation in this story, the part where Jacob and Esau's journey has the script writers adding a lot of music, perhaps some slow motion walking, increasing the anticipation, not knowing if Esau would hit or hug Jacob when they met each other. A few things happened before we got to that part. There's a moment of return. Or perhaps for Jacob, it had been many years of wanting to return, recognizing that he'd done wrong in relationship. And when he decides to return home, he offers actions that speak of apology, gifts, the movement from his side to the other, 
and in Jacob's case, a little God wrestling. God wrestling happens when we step into the brave space of reconciliation. It may seem like a dream, but it's quite real as we wrestle with when and how, what actions, how to listen and respond. But this moment for Jacob of God wrestling, St. Augustine wrote that God is nearer to us than we are to ourselves, but different enough to make us more than ourselves. In the wrestling with God, Jacob asks for a blessing. Jacob knows that he needs more than he has. And not only does he receive the blessing and a name change from Jacob to Israel to mark a new beginning, but he's also wounded. He's limping. He carries with them the hurt, the hurt he has caused as we often carry with us the hurts we've experienced. In the God wrestling, Jacob is reminded that he could be right or he could be in relationship, that God always wants to be in relationship with us. And God makes space for us to choose another way. It's a brave space. Jacob is so changed that he says he sees the face of God. And later, when that big moment comes, when he finally sees his brother after a long while, he says to Esau that he sees the face of God reflected back to him. It hearkens to another musical, to the words, in Victor Hugo's novel and the last words in the musical Les Miserables, to love another person is to see the face of God. And in each story we've experienced lately, we see the face of God in the one you least expect. God's grace is known in the one that's been disgraced, the one we assume God hated, the prodigal son, the Samaritan, the leper who returned to say thank you, the woman at the well, the carpenter's son from Nazareth who was not welcomed back to his hometown, the one who helped us to see our neighbors in a different way, who ate with those who no one else would, who saw the image of God reflected in everyone, the one who knew those stories and lived them in new ways, the one who widens our circle of reconciliation, and the one who called his followers family. When asked who his family was, Jesus responded, and I'll share with you a paraphrase from the song in More Voices, Kindred in Spirit. He says, who is my mother? Who is my brother? All those who gather round Jesus Christ. Spirit-blown people born from the gospel sit at the table round Jesus Christ. Differently abled, differently labeled, wide in the circle round Jesus Christ. Crutches and stigmas, cultures, enigmas, all come together round Jesus Christ. Love will relate us, color or status, can't segregate us round Jesus Christ. Family failings, human derailings, all are accepted round Jesus Christ. Bound by one vision, met for one mission, we claim each other round Jesus Christ. Here is my mother, here is my brother, kindred in spirit through Jesus Christ. These stories, the life of Christ rooted in them, calls us to wonder about how do we reflect back the image of God? Do we want to be right or do we want to be in relationship? I pray that God will continue to open us to brave space for friendly relations and reconciliation so that together we can be about the work at the table where he was hungry and we're 
to feed him. He was thirsty and we offer him a drink. He was naked and we offer clothes. He was a stranger and we welcomed him. May we be open to see and hear and respond to the face of God in each other, to the face of Christ that we meet. Amen. you to join me now in prayer. God of reconciliation, open our hearts to your presence. Open our eyes, our ears, and our mouths for the sake of your truth. Open our entire lives to your will for us. And for all the ways that we have failed to serve you, for those in need we have ignored, for those we have wronged, for those we have rejected. Cleanse us with your grace and your forgiveness. Rescue us from the folly of comparison and competition, God. And when the world tries to pull us into battle, equip us for the healing work of transformation, bringing your love and your justice to an earth thirsting for both. Inspire our hearts that we may give favor to those who the world count as last or least. Widen our sphere of compassion and strengthen us to navigate the complexity of relationship with integrity. 
And when conflict arises in our lives, that is almost sure to do, help us to choose grace over hostility, reconciliation over revenge, and equality over rivalry. Take over our sight, God, that when we look in the face of those who were once rivals, that we might see your face. And take over our lives, God, that we in turn may reflect your face to them and all we meet. And may we do so following faithfully in the way Jesus leads us as we pray together now in song. The act of offering is a bold tearing up of the line that separates us. It invites us into an action of love. As you receive this gift of love, the offering will be now received.
Can you feel how music can draw us closer along the path? I'm grateful for music that speaks into the places we don't even have words for on this journey. And that invitation to be part of mending the world together, of offering our gifts. I'm so grateful that you've used the virtual offering plate or sent checks to the office or done an e-transfer to office at islingtonunited.org, making ways for us to keep being love in this community and beyond. One of my favorite things about this space is that when we leave here, we go into Stuart East Hall together and we gather around round tables or we stand and share in relationship and meal. We've had a legacy of the hospitality ministry for decades in this place. And as the new kitchen is finished and we step into the final chapter of fundraising, as we make room for what's possible for people socially distanced, feeding the community, we have yet to write this next part of our ministry. But you're part of that, of the legacy, of the remembering, and of the now. I'm grateful for the work that's been done to show you, to show pictures, to tell the story of the kitchen. They say often the kitchen is the heart of the home, and it is a place here where love is shared and where people see the face of God in each other across the table when they're either preparing or eating together or cleaning up together. I am confident there will be a time that that will happen again. For now, we're being creative in how we offer hospitality. We're gathering on Sunday evenings for resonance online for Zoom. We're gathering for the Islington United Book Club on Tuesday night, exploring the wide circumference of love novel and meeting the author of that book, Marita. I can't wait to hear a part of her story. And you keep meeting each other through meditation and daily messages, through hearing the notes that come through Jason's musical reflections on Thursdays. Stay a little longer following the service and we'll be together to share good news and pass the peace and pray together on Facebook Live. Just scroll down a little bit. It's right on the same page of our website. Each of these acts of radical hospitality help us see the face of God in each other and remind us that we are one.
May the Christ who walks on wounded feet walk with you on this road. May the Christ who serves with wounded hands stretch out your hands to serve. May the Christ who loves with a wounded heart open our hearts to love. And may you see the face of Christ in everyone you meet. And may everyone see the face of Christ in you. Go in peace. Amen. Thank you.